Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight Howard trailblazers and movemakers that are not only making moves in their respective industry, but really all over the world. Today, we have an amazing guest. Um, I think this brother's story definitely needs to be heard. I'm sure you guys have heard of his uh his, his company, which is called Step Africa. They've been all over the world, all over the world, not just in DC, um, but many people have referred to him as a nation builder, a visionary, civic and community leader. He's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Beta Chapter. He's founder and executive director of Step Africa, a native of Houston, Texas, and of course a graduate of Howard University School of Business. He's won numerous awards. And, and one thing that I really want to talk to him about is how he's able to have a festival in Johannesburg, South Africa, you know, but yet be, you know, located in Washington, DC. I think that's a huge, huge accomplishment. So without further ado, I definitely want to welcome to the show, C. Brian Williams. Brother Williams, welcome to the show. What's up? How are you, man? I'm great. I'm great, man. It, it's such an honor to have you on the show because I've always heard about Steph Africa. Not that yeah. I'm, I'm into that, but, you know, when you hear something over and over and over again and you finally get to meet the person who's not yeah. only the person running it, but you're the brainchild. Yeah, it. man. And it's been around over, you know, over 20 years, over 25 years now. Yeah. You know, when you look back on things from where you started to now, you know, I'm sure you probably got some old pictures that you probably come up and look at sometimes. <laughs> you probably was dancing in Burr or dancing <laughs> in School of Engineering to, to now where you're performing against to audiences of people that don't even speak the same language as you. Like, what does that feel like? Right. Man, let me tell you, this, been a, uh, this whole experience is really founded on campus at Howard University. The reason I'm doing what I do right now is because of those four maybe four and a half years <laughs> at Howard University. Uh, you know, I, entered, I got to school there in 1986. That's when I first walked on the campus. My, my father is actually a graduate of Howard in the mid-60s. Um, I only applied to one school, man, that was HU. And when I got there, it was really, you know, it was the environment I needed to develop and grow. You know, so all the ideas... Everything that I do now was really strongly informed by not just, you know, growing up in, with my parents in <clears throat> Texas, but Howard, you know, played a huge part of that development. That's dope. That's dope. I mean, so Step Africa, man, what, what is Step Africa? For, for folks that might have heard about it but don't know exactly what it is, Yeah. you know, break it down. What is Step Africa? Well, Step Africa is the first professional dance company in the world dedicated to this tradition of stepping. And we've been around for 25 years. Um, I actually started exploring the art form of stepping um, when I pledged undergraduate and how, when I pledged beta. That was my first time stepping and really kind of getting into the culture, the tradition, the style. That was your first time getting exposed to this? Yeah, man, because I mean, you know, back in those <laughs> days, if you weren't in the 80s, if you weren't born around the college campus, right? You might actually might not know the tradition of stepping. Man, that's crazy. It was an alpha, it wasn't like he was stepping all over the house. So I just, it wasn't a, uh, a big part of my culture. So I didn't really see it until I got on the yard at Howard University. That's pretty amazing, man. Yeah. You know, most people like when they see stepping, you know, they're getting excited. Oh, I want to show off. you like, hmm, business idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, this is going to be my future for the next um umpteen or whatever year right. <laughs> you know that's that's pretty pretty amazing i mean was what was the step culture like when you got to howard to have that type of impact on you that's a good question man so this is 19 i pledged my fraternity in 1989 and you know for all your uh your audience who you know weren't on campus at that time it was a really interesting experience to see all the fraternities and sororities pledging at the same time Right. You kind of like pledged out in the open a little bit too. You could pledge above ground, man. Yeah. And it was a fascinating thing to witness on campus. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen school days, right? Yeah. 
for sure. So it was like school days. Man. But it was crazy. like school days everywhere. Damn, that's you know, crazy. It was, I, I love that, man. I, I, I really think that we lost something when pledging was made illegal and went underground. It was such a rich tradition that uh, I learned a lot from. It was a wild process. But everyone could be a part of it. It was like this community process to see yeah. this young men and young women going through this process to become members of these organizations. It was wild, man. I loved it. Yeah. No, you know what? Um, I had uh, another guy from Beta on here. He said the exact same thing. He yeah. was like, man, you know, because you hear all these horror stories of pledging. Yeah. You know, of course, that happens when it's underground. But he was just saying, like, what it felt like to be doing it out in the open. He said it was just different. You know, he yeah. kind of like, I want to say he missed it, but he was like, you know, he really appreciated everything about it, you know. So that's yeah, man. That's pretty cool. I Like Sundays, we would all, like, the lines would show up in front of Rankin Chapel. And, you know, the Sigmas and the, whoever would be out there would greet, would have to greet the uh, their brothers or their sisters, you know, the sororities, and they would they would be like showing off, showing off to the community how what they have learned, how they have grown as oh. a. It was just it was just fascinating, and then of course we'd all go do chapel together. It was a really really rich culture. Is that is that something that's discussed? Because I didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, that. man. I didn't know that at yeah. all. Yeah, I mean, you should have a podcast on pleasure. We should do like a, a multiple Zoom call. Yeah. <laughs> about this, the, 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 and with images of what the yard was like prior to 1990. When so do you, do you think that that's something that was unique to Howard or was that? No, I think okay. Howard has had a very unique experience with it, with, you know, being the birthplace of six of historically mm -hmm. you know, of the divine nine, if you will. Right. But uh, on black campuses across the black college campus in particular, I think it was very a robust period, but Howard's yard, you know, Howard's yard is always special. Yeah, for sure. So you, you came in, Howard, what year? 86. Came in 86, graduated? 1990-ish. 1990-ish. You know how brothers do. Yeah, uh, hey, I, that was one of my biggest regrets is not taking an extra year. You know, oh, you got out of four? Yeah, that was a <laughs> Yeah, I did. But my mom was on my, on my back. She was like, hey, you know, you got four Good years to graduate, job. two years to stay at the house with me, and that's it. You know, so. I that followed, was well done. I follow both of those paths. You know, so Step Africa, man. So you come out with Step Africa in '94, right? Yeah. So I finished school. I, I, I my first. I grad. I'm in the School of Business at Howard University. I graduate uh, 1990, December 1990. So really, like four and a half years. Yeah. Hanging around, and I don't want to do the corporate thing at the time. I'm more interested in really following my passion, and I wanted to live and work in Africa. Oh, okay. First job out of Howard is to do a fellowship in Lesotho, the small country in Southern Africa. So I moved to Lesotho about two months after graduating. I was living in Southern Africa, just like that. Damn. So, you know, at Howard, like when you were in, in, the, in the frat at Howard, are you like stepmaster? Like, are you like on it like you that? Know, no, bro. Wow. Lie. I can step. <laughs> And I was on the step teams, you know, I, I, I represented very well, but I wasn't the step master. My sands were the step, my, I had two of my sands were the step masters. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you moved to Africa four years, so you moved to Africa right out of college? Yep. Wow, so you moved to Africa, and in, in the back of your head is this thing, are you like, man, I really want to have a stepping, is it called like a stepping company? Well, it was interesting, so... I get to the continent and I'm living there, and this is in Southern Africa in 1990, 1991, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of give you the picture, uh, Mandela has been released, but apartheid is still ruling the day in South Africa. Man. So it's a wild time to be in, the, in that region, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Spike Lee was actually down, I'll never forget I met him, he was down there uh, filming Malcolm X during that time, the movie in South Africa. And I get the idea because I start, I, I see um, my students every day. I was teaching down okay. up in, in Southern Africa. And one day I saw this little boy on the side of the road doing a dance that looked a lot like stepping. And when I saw that, it kind of kind of threw me off. And so I decided to explore and investigate a little bit. 
It turned out it was the South African gumboot dance, which is this, per, it's this percussive dance form created by men who worked in the mines of South Africa. So I got kind of excited about that and uh, decided to teach them some of the steps that I learned on Howard University. So here's the gym. I'm like 21 years old, hanging out in Africa with these brothers. And I'm like, let me teach you some steps. Did, did they know anything about like Greek life? Zero. None. They had no idea. Okay. Zero. I mean, because the, com the communication between our countries at that time was so limited. Yeah. You know? This is not, although we were very involved in the Free, Free South Africa movement, the anti-apartheid movement here in the U.S., you know, there wasn't a lot of people-to-people, -people, cultural, artistic exchange between Southern Africa and America. So once I had that experience, I, it, it, something like clicked, and I was like, you know what? I want to merge the two art forms together. I want to bring stepping to Africa. So you're, you're in South Africa, right? Southern Africa, yeah, South Africa. Southern, okay. Is it like one of the more developed parts? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Southern Africa in general on the continent is one of the more developed parts of the whole continent, you know? Okay. Yeah, I had, I had a chance to go to South Africa for Yeah? A, a few Where'd you go? Years. Went to Johannesburg, went to um, Soweto, went to yeah. um, a few different parts. Um, I went to Ghana as well, which is West Africa. Stay right two weeks so it was it was a dope experience but it was definitely a big difference between um you know south africa is, is different because you got parts that look like new york you know chicago miami san francisco yeah. then you got other parts that look like you know the stereotypical stuff that you see on tv and yeah. they're only miles apart so it was none, nonetheless or uh, camps bay that's where we stayed for a little bit we did the safari so it was it was a dope experience you know yeah man dope I mean, experience you know, so for sure I'm glad you were there because, you know, a lot of people don't get a chance to go to the continent. Yeah. Now, I've been like maybe 30, probably 40, 50 times at this point. Crazy. Crazy. It's a big part of my life and it has been since that time, you know, and uh, it really has inspired my whole life, my relationship with the continent. In fact, you went to Soweto. Soweto is where we actually first started the Step Africa International Cultural Festival. The poster behind me. Is a poster that we made for our festival in Johannesburg, South Africa. So nice. Get hanging out in those streets, man, stepping and dancing and loving life. Yeah, it, it's an amazing, amazing continent. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. But to be there at the time when apartheid is still going on, you know, what, talk about that for a second. Yeah. I mean, you know, cause it's not like, it's not 1900, you know what I'm saying? Right. This, this, is, is, this is 20 years ago, you know what I'm right. saying? Or 25 years, whenever, you know, to be there at that time, I mean, and to go from Washington DC, which is kind of, you know, very diverse and yeah. Red Howard where, you're not even conscious of being black when you're at Howard. You know what I'm saying? You, right. You know, you just get in where you fit in. But now you go to a continent that is, quote, unquote, the motherland. Yeah. But our people are being oppressed. You know? Yeah, man. What, what is that like for you? Well, you know, it's, it's a really good conversation to have, especially dealing with, you know, what's happening in America right now, which, which, which has, happen, has been happening in America for a long time. But you know, I'm, I'll never forget, I'm in Lesotho, which is kind of like this safe country in the middle of South Africa. But I would hitchhike sometimes into Johannesburg and I would hang out there and you would get to Johannesburg and it would feel so different because of the apartheid and the oppression that uh, white Afrikaners were placing upon the people. And, and, that's, and that's visible to you. Is it visible or is it like, a, is it an energy or is it like visible? It feels very, it felt at the time, very dark, you know? I went to Soweto and it's this beautiful township and the people are beautiful, but stuff just seemed kind of muted, you know? Uh, you could still see that there was beauty there and love, but the country was dealing with a lot of struggle at that time. And so I would be there, I'd be hanging out. I made a lot of good friends in South Africa. I learned about the culture and I spent a lot of time there for that year and a half kind of hanging out and, uh, 
and that, that that year, that year plus, really kind of, when I got back, I never forget I was on the plane coming back home, and I was like, what am I going to do? What I want to do? And I said, I could do Step Africa. I could teach. Um, but I think I want to create a way to bring our cultures together, you know? And so that's what I did. So when you over there, I mean, are, are there good white people over there? That, that yeah, man, there's befriending? good white people everywhere. But you know what I mean? Like, is it, you know how like you might, like now you might say, okay, one in every 10 is bad. But maybe back then it's like nine and ten, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it like, so like, are you navigating to the point where like, man, you know, you don't know who, like who to trust? You no, know? you know what's so funny, man? It kind of feels like today's America. Really? Yeah. Even yeah. Africa back then, even under the, it's kind of like, even with the system of apartheid, right? It still felt like maybe 30% of the white population, maybe 30 or 40% was, did not, did not did reject the system. Did not, well, let's not say fully rejected it, but did believe in equality for African people. Mm -hmm. Maybe the then like almost split, maybe 40 to 50% did not, you know? Wow. So interesting, like in our times here, we're still dealing with that now, you know? That's a good, good comparison. We're still <laughs> dealing with that now, man. Yeah, that's a really good comparison. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, so stuff Africa is birthed on the way back. That's when you kind of like, yo, I need to figure out how to monetize this situation because it's a passion and I want to dedicate my life to it. You know, when does that happen? Right. Well, you know, that's interesting. I mean, the, 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 the transition from idea to business or monetization, that, that was quite a journey. Yeah. You know, and as a nonprofit, you know, step Africa is a nonprofit. So, we exist to, to serve, and we have a mission, which is to preserve and uh, promote the tradition of stepping and use it as an educational tool for young people everywhere. So that kind of guy has guided me for the last 25 years, you know? But nonprofit don't mean no profit, right? You still no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But, it, but, you know, but, but you know what it does mean, bro? What, it, what, I, what, I, what I've always appreciated and respected about the nonprofit structure, and I, and I wish, I hope more of us, will do mm -hmm. is that it is really about like the money that we create the money that we raise the money that we earn from performing really goes back into the organization to employ more people to create more opportunity to serve more children right uh yeah and that's why i, I actually really like that because it's kind of my, my, my mission as a so i'm more of a social entrepreneur right mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm, I'm, a, I'm paid as as the leader of south africa I'm an employee of Step Africa, but and what a lot of people don't know is that having a nonprofit, you you give up a lot of control because you got a board of directors. You got to you do, you do. So, you know, and they're, and they're there to protect the interests of the people. Yeah. These tax deductions and these breaks, which allow you to do the work, and they help you. They help govern the organization. You know, so for those young folks, you know, we got to do better with the whole black business structure. You know. Mm -hmm. I want us to get more sophisticated moving forward in terms of the development of black business in America, you know? Absolutely. More aggressive on that. Yeah. So why, why nonprofit route? You know, why not go to LLC corporation, yeah. you know, that, that motto. The nonprofit route felt right because it was so mission based, you know? Mm -hmm. And a, and I wanted the, the capacity to apply for grants, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. a lot of the structures, a lot of the foundations only give to grant, you know, only give to nonprofit organizations, not for profit, you know, because of the structure. And so becoming a nonprofit allowed me to apply for grants through my through DC government. I'm based in Washington, DC, through the DC Commission of Arts and Humanities, you know, every local, every city normally has like some kind of funding agency, agency, I'm sorry, for the arts. Mm. So that nonprofit allowed me to access those funds to to get to, you know that's the, that's the source of capital for nonprofit. Smart, you know? smart. Yeah, no, I I totally get it. But you know, a lot of people they hear the word nonprofit and it's just a sexy word. Right. You know, they don't really understand because I have a non I had a nonprofit called Swiss Dreams where we teach kids math and reading through sports because I taught. Oh, seven, excellent, man. Yeah, I taught for seven years, so I just remember doing it like you. It was just like. 
I was just doing it. You know, I was a teacher. That was the way I was teaching my kids how to read. Yeah. Then it became a hobby. Then it became a thing. Next thing I know, I had a camp. Then I was what? like, yeah, I had a camp. We got up to 700 kids, you know, up until I, I own an insurance agency now. And I got, I'm married with two kids. But before, prior to kids and all of that, that's what I was doing, you know. And it was a ton of work. And just like you said, that money comes in just because you get a million dollars. That don't mean. You keep money dollars. Dollars. That million dollars is going right to whatever your mission is. It's yeah. Wrong, you know, because if you don't spend it, you may not get it again next year. So, <laughs> so I definitely understand because every year you're operating on a budget. Every right. Year. So to, so, to, so to be in this game 25 years, especially in a business where when you start it, you have no real blueprint. You know what I mean? Right. Of right. course, there are dance companies out there, but for you to be the first of this kind, for you to be who you are, you know, it's not like, I, I promise, man, when I saw this, when I, I stepped Africa, I was thinking, okay, there's going to be some dark skinned dude with dreads. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm thinking. You know, so I know this is a dark, you, I'm just a dark skinned dude with a short haircut. So I know you had your fair share of challenges and which I definitely want to get into, man. But, <laughs> you know, but I want to ask you, what, what made you decide to come to Howard? My dad went to Howard, bro. Oh, for real. But, you know, what really made me decide is, I don't know, some really cool folks from, from uh, Houston went to Howard. And I just didn't consider anything else, man. I kind of looked. Yeah, you said that was your only school you applied to. I applied to one school, bro. I applied, like in, <laughs> I applied like in October of my senior year. And I got in, and I was like, I'm good. So what, what kind of student are you when you were in high man, school? I was a solid student, you know. Okay. Are you like. Yeah, I got a little cum laude. I okay, little, okay. <laughs> stunt, stunt for him. Let him know. <laughs> let, let you know, know. If I had really worked hard, I probably could have got a cord with some benefits, but. That's real. I'll hold the cum laude. Man, yeah. <laughs> I can't even say that. So I'm like, don't even That's a funny this. question, man. That's, I, I, I thought about that. I almost forgot. I, did, I, got, I got some. I, I think I barely made it, though. I was just fighting to get that cum laude at the end of the day. I was like, let me just slide into the cum laude. <laughs> I'm good. What about high school? What type of student are you? You know, when, I'm a private school. And I've, I've, I've always been a good student. I went to a private school in Houston, Texas. And... Um, it was actually a college prep, but really, really prepared me nicely for Howard. You know, quite honest, for college. I mean, that's what it's supposed to do. So I've always been about the books. You know, I've always enjoyed learning, you know. And so that's why I think when I started my business, even though I didn't, knew nothing about nonprofit management or writing a grant, you know, I had those, those skills, those fundamental skills that allowed me to compete, you know. And, you know, we got to compete, bro. We got so much stacked up against us. We got to compete. You know, we have to compete aggressively. Yeah. We, have to the, we have to develop the skills that allow us to compete, you know, so. Now, were you, were you like, uh, were you, I guess, immersed in any African culture when you were in high school? Or were you stepping at all or dancing at all? Hmm. In high school, no. I was involved in the theater, in the arts, you know. Oh really? So you were in the arts, so you you kind of so you kind of have a you kind of have it in you to be. On I've always had a foot in the arts. Okay. I've always okay. had a love for the arts. You know. Talk about that, cause a lot of a lot of guys, you know, brothers are not in the arts. Yeah. Um, on any level, to be honest, um, especially not in high school. I know it's become more popular now. Right. You know, as we are have progressed as a society, but yeah, I feel like for you to be doing that in the early '80s. Um, yeah, mid eighties. I mean, that had to be a little bit different. That's interesting because you know, it was always just something kind of a part of my life. It was ever the center. Mm -hmm. you know? I enjoyed it. Um, I kind of grew up loving African American history and culture in particular. You know, and I really enjoyed um, learning about our history and the poetry that's created by our culture and the music. So that was just always a part of my life. Going to performances as a you know young child all the way up through high school. So I got to Howard, you know, the Mecca, and all this culture is around and all these traditions. Um, I was ready for it, you know, and I just took it in. I used to love being in Moreland Spin Yard, man, on the third floor. Really? But all that, that's where E. Ethel Bill Miller used to sit up there, and he was like this resident poet. Uh, and he'd have all these, this, all these amazing 
books and he said re- he was a resident poet i think in my office he was a resident poet he's, he's he was a poet yeah but i think he was a director of the moreland resource center something like that yeah i know they have like the largest poet. collection of like african american like you know i forgot literature what, yeah i forgot what the stat is but it's like yeah. a serious stat like that you have to learn when you come to Howard, like that right, building, <laughs> that building ain't nothing to play with. You know what I mean? So yeah, you spent I, some time. You, did you spend some good time in there? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, we had to learn about it. Being a campus pal, you know, we had to learn about right every building, whether you wanted to or not. And right. uh, so yeah, that was definitely something that I got to learn about. And of course, um, you know, you learn. <laughs> You learn about buildings when you don't have visitation as a, uh, <laughs> you learn about certain. You know what? I had a feeling you were going with that. I had a feeling you were going with that. You know, so but well, that's, look, a, that's a whole nother, whole nother show. That's a different podcast, bro. <laughs> yeah, totally different podcast, man. So it's safe to say that your dad influenced you to come to Howard, right? Yeah, I mean, both my dad and my brother and his brother went to Howard. My mom, I was, that's it, dope, man. Was your, was your yeah. uncle uh, Alpha too? No, yes, he is. Actually, he is. Man. He is, man. My mother went to Fisk. So, bottom line, a historically black college was where I was going, without question. Yeah. My great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, they went, some, they went to Marshall College, Hudson, Tillerson, something like that, way back in the day. So, we've been going to black colleges ever since that's dope. right to do so. Absolutely. That's dope. I mean, is it just by chance that, you know, you always had – an appreciation for African culture. Then you come to Howard, you want to go to Africa, you become an alpha, which as we know, has roots in African culture as well. Was that right. just all that, that just kind of happened like that? I think, I think it was just an interest in culture in, the, in general, man, mm-hmm. of African American history and culture, you know, step Africa. I don't know if you know this. We have, have you been to the new museum? Yeah, I've been. Yeah. Did you, did you see the step Africa exhibit? I'm going to say this, man. We was there for three hours, me and my wife, what? and we yeah. were trying to take in everything. We didn't know. We weren't expecting because we weren't doing homecoming. So um, my wife didn't go to Howard. So I'm like, you know, let's go. But it's you got to r- literally spend no, man. a week in there. You know what at I'm most. saying? So, at, 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 I'm sorry, at least. So it's like it's hard to be like, did you see? It's like, ah, dang, I didn't see that. Ah, not nah. like we was literally yeah. like, dang, dang. So, yeah, but. That's awesome. You got an exhibit. You got something in there. Yeah, man. We're all, we, we, were the, we created the world's first stepping interactive exhibit. It's on the second floor in the Explore More Gallery. Oh, uh, no. I would have remembered that. I didn't see it. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like this huge, it's probably one of those most popular interactives that they have in the museum. Man, how does that feel to have your work in probably the number one museum for, yeah. our, for our culture in the world? Feels good. Good is not <laughs> that. That sounds kind of, you know, no, lowballing. It feels. Man, I mean, you know, you know what's so funny? I don't. I'm glad you feel that way about it. To me, it was just. I was just an honor. I'm, I'm honored, right? Yeah. But no, no buts. It's there, and it's huge. <laughs> That's crazy. It's like this beautiful exhibit, and you can basically walk up. You got to think like they could have put anything in there. You know what you're I mean? Right. Like, right. it's no, so right. much stuff to pull from. You're right. And think about all the things that got cut that didn't make the list. You're right. No, you're right. So when you look at it like, man, you know, my joint is here. Like, people, it's people that sponsors that pay $5 million, $20 just to have their name this big oh, or something. You know what I'm saying? You're right. That's so that they can be remembered in history. So that, that just, to me, that says that, the work you're that you're right, doing, man. I appreciate you can't you. even put a price on it. You know what I'm saying? Like your impact. No, you cannot. You cannot. So every four minutes we say somebody can walk up and learn how to step with Step Africa at the, at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. I love that museum. I love what it does for our culture. And, of course, I'm glad that we have a, a wonderful position in that space, you know? It's crazy, man. Congratulations, bro. That's Thank dope. you, bro. That's super dope. Thank bro. you, man. <laughs> Now, when I go back, you know I'm going to be looking for it. You got to go check it <laughs> you know out, man. And how old, how old are your kids? Six and three. Oh, man. You, got, when you do that. Please just take the picture of them stepping in front of the exhibit and tag us. Oh, for sure. For sure, man. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So when you get to Howard, what's that energy like? What's the paint the scene for me coming? If I if I walk into Howard in the mid eighties, what is that like? What am I seeing? All right, I'll tell you what I'm seeing just for a historical perspective. I think this is always interesting because you came in at a very different time. When'd you get there? 99. Right, okay, you're 99. I walk in Howard, because it's, kind of it's kind of interesting in terms of where African-American culture was at the time. Oh, okay. Campus, house music is dominating the scene, hmm. right? Everybody loves house music. And to be honest, there's a, in terms of the mainstream culture of the campus, it's kind of a European, European kind of vibe, right? Fashion show, it's very black, but there's this look at, I mean, I still think that it wasn't fully embracing Africanness. That was more like a segment of the culture, right? It's about just being black, very American, right? Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, halfway through, and this is like overall, hip hop hits, right? Wow. And you start to see the culture of the campus change. You know, I always joke like, it's kind of like that with New Jack City, like before New Jack City, like the whole light skin, dark skin mess that I can't stand. You know, there was just kind of raising, dealing with that pseudo division between African Americans of colorism. But then hip hop comes, there's this whole new swag and this whole new culture that's taking over the campus. And I remember being like, not being a hip hop dude, not being from New York, I felt kind of like, wait a minute. I walk in campus, I'm good. You know, all of a sudden hip hop takes over and the whole culture has changed. You know, the protest happens, the big protest take over the A building. That happens during that time. And it was a really exciting time. I loved it, man. I loved seeing that transition. People started to embrace connections with Africa even more, main across the board, not just niche, you know? So it was an interesting time. It was like awakening, I think. Man. You know? I, when I left, I don't know how it kept moving, but I do think hip-hop kind of started to move Howard and the culture of the, of, of the school in a very great direction, in a more African direction, versus, uh, you know, imitation of life kind of experience, you know? With all respect. So are you one of those guys that stayed in Sutton? No, man. <laughs> no. All Drew, Slow, Towers. Got it. Bam. Got it. Graduation. So you came in the School of B, right? Yeah, School of B. School of B. Was that a safe major that you were picking, or was that some, a passion? You know, it was, a, it was a major that my parents' folks made me do. Okay. I've probably done theater. Because I was going to ask you, man, like, being a brother, you can't just tell arts. your parents you're going to major in arts. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. You want to they were like, "I'm not paying for that, man." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They, they, and I was like, "Get it?" <laughs> Sounds like marketing. <laughs> okay. Same here, man. Same here. I was, Are you serious? Yeah, marketing. I was like, uh, oh, I came in. I came in a bio major. I looked at them classes. Oh, I was like, Nah. I walked over to the school of business. I was like, They look like they. Really, you know, man? You gonna you gonna be a doctor? Yeah, because I had two dentists that lived on my block. I should have stuck with it. But my mom, her rule was you just got four years to finish. And I right. knew myself at the time. Right. I wasn't studious. I mean, I was smart enough. Like, I wasn't, like, the dumbest kid. But I was going right. to get a B, an A, C, you know, 3.0, basically. So I, I was looking. I was like, man, I'm coming here. Like, my, I came to Howard. Like, I went to all-boy high school, all-white. Yeah. So for me, it was, like, liberating. So I knew that. I was going to want to hang out a little bit in biology, right. chemistry, all of that. That wasn't going to allow me to live, live my best life. <laughs> so, so, no, I, no. so I, 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 think you, I think you made the right decision, man. Cause you know, yeah. those, what they call them, the Valley folks. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, I love being in the school of being. Oh, me too. It was the best thing ever. I mean, it was, I learned a lot. The friendships were great, you know, not yeah. to say that you can't do that anywhere else, but I feel like I was kind of set up to, at the very least, if I if I fell on my face, I would have you know a job, you know. But right, right. But yeah, School of B was dope, man. It was a great experience, man. So, so when you're on campus, what what organizations are you involved in 
that are kind of help shaping your later decision? You know, one of my favorite classes, I'll tell you that, was um, African American, uh, it's out the way, African American uh, studies. Uh huh. I remember taking that class and I was like, yes. You know, I had always studied black history all the way through high school. I mean, from, from you know, grade school all the way through. Hmm. But getting to that class was just like, it was an, an elective. So I just started, I just took like, the second I took African American studies, one, two, a couple of other black lit classes. Cause I just wanted to take the classes, you know, and wanted to dive into the culture, into our culture as much as possible from these amazing professors. So that was a big part of my thing. Then I think, you know, I, I got involved in the forensic society as well, which kind of got, helped me with my love for the arts and also allowed me to read, learn much more about African poetry and prose and writers. So, so when, you, when you're taking these classes, it's obviously stimulating a part of you. I mean, is it, is it debates going on there? Like uh, Du Bois versus Washington? Is that, you know, is it life? Oh, in the forensic society? No, just in the African American studies, because I know, you know, when I got to Howard, that was my first time learning about Talented Tenth, like hearing that ever. Oh yeah. I'm like, man, what is that? You know what I'm saying? And they breaking that down. I, like that was the first time I've ever heard anything like that. First time hearing the word diaspora. You know what right. I'm saying? Oh yes. Like, like what is that? What does this mean? You what's know, what's a diaspora? Right. What's a diaspora? You know, right. um, light skin, dark skin. You always hear. You know, I mean, I think every black person is exposed to to those stereotypes. But even right. getting deeper with the um, Du Bois versus um, Booker T. Booker Washington, T. yeah. You know, um, it was just, I, I don't know, man. Being in that space, when you're able to disagree and, and agree, yeah, and you're able to disagree with people that are making excellent points. Yeah, <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Right. Like you're like, damn, okay, well, let me, I'll be right back. I'm going to go, you know, like, it's, <laughs> let, me go, let me go read a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. So I can yeah. bring back my point. Right. Because when you, you know, coming from high school, it was black history month, of course, but you didn't get, you didn't go deep into, right. you know, MLK or Martin Luther King or, you know, you went surface with a lot of that stuff. Yes. Like going at how when you went to Howard, it was, it was great for your self-esteem. You yeah, you can I mean? dive into the culture. You can dive into the culture, man. And that's why I think there's nothing like a Howard, an education at Howard University, because I was able to dive into the culture in ways that were just, that were empowering. Mm -hmm. For me, it was like, I'll, I'll never forget, like, I wrote this speech on this paper on the Negro spiritual, you know? Mm -hmm. So I studied the Negro spirituals at Howard and how they had dual meanings and that they weren't just songs of, morning but they were songs of there were messages so i love knowing that i love knowing about the powerful side of our culture the victor the victor the victories the wins you know the resilience you know so i learned that so you know when i left howard man quite honestly you really couldn't tell me anything i had no problem with confidence <laughs> so you and, probably I, and, and, you know and i would you know and in terms in the face of being in diverse environments i, I would never feel intimidated because of my howard university education i would never feel uncentered because I was very clear on African American history. I was very clear mm. I was in this country. I, I, and, I, and that even extends into the day. I'm very clear who I am and, and leading Step Africa for 25 years. I'm clear mm. on creating work, employment opportunities for black artists, uh, not just artists, but administration as well, so that we can build an organization, control our own narrative, and serve the community in ways that no one else can do it, you know? Did anybody ever question you in terms oh, yeah. of, like, you don't fit the, the, the stereotypical person that would, in, in terms of physical makeup. Yeah. You're not a woman, so why are you leading the dance thing? You're not right. dark-skinned brother with dreads. Why are you leading this movement? You know, did... I don't know, for lack of a better word, like, did your black card ever get questioned or do you ever feel like, huh? Like, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe it could be yeah. something where it was subconscious where you might even overreact it because you might have felt a way. I don't know. You know, did you ever... I mean, that's an interesting question, man. You know what's so funny about that? 
you know, being from Texas in particular and um, looking at my family structure, I mean, no, colorism is so real, I, I get it. But looking at the history and the experience of African-Americans, right? Like our culture is more important than the color for me, <clears throat> you know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. The culture defines us. And, our, I, and, and when you know the culture well, you know where the color comes from. So it's not something for to really, really be proud of, quite honestly. I mean, and, and, and nothing to be ashamed of either, but it's definitely nothing to kind of throw in somebody's face. Right, right. That, uh, you know, your parents might have been raped uh, by, um, your ancestors might have been raped by, you know, an owner or something like that. Or in, in some cases, there were loving examples of between white and black in the early 1800s, late, late 1900s. So, you know, it's a complex situation, but we're, and, and, and our culture is a complex culture, man. Absolutely. Our experience is a complex, you cannot, it's not black and white, it's not light skin, dark skin. It's all of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I try no. to represent that in my work with South <clears throat> Africa. Like, I'm always trying to represent African American culture as completely as possible. So, if you come to our performance, you know, it's just for the culture. What, what is African American culture? I mean, African American culture is 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 jazz, is blues, is mm -hmm. is uh, Harlem Renaissance, is Black Broadway on U Street, is Duke Ellington, it's uh, Reconstruction, it's it's slavery, you know, it's what happened to prior to slavery, it's the Stoner Rebellion, it's the Negro Act of so it's it's so many different things. It's it's so much. These four hundred years that we have been here, we have done so many different things, and the fact that we're still here and so strong. And so present, with lots of challenges and, and problems, clearly, is a testament to the strength of a people well, and, and of a culture. Because, you know, quite honestly, you know, we should not be here. Right, right, yeah. We should have been, been gone. Been gone. Once we were no longer needed. Yeah. You That's know? why I love, um, you know, honestly, man, doing these interviews and talking to people like you. It's just like the, the triumphs, man. People really don't hear about that. You know, right. unless they're really independent thinkers right. and exploring, you know, you, you just don't get to see who's running Step Africa. Yeah. Or, you know, like Howard was my first time having black teachers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was the first time that I had that. It was my first time in all aspects, just seeing yeah. that level of black excellence on in such a diverse way you know what i'm saying yeah. like that's just kicking it going out smoking weed getting straight a's like damn how you do that <laughs> you know what i'm saying like right. it was <laughs> i'm like man you know because as a kid you know your parents like don't do this don't do that don't do that. i'm like damn you get to howard everything my parents told me that you couldn't do i seen kids doing it and excelling <laughs> right <laughs> doing like, it and damn. still doing it and doing it well yeah i'm like yo and then they're getting crazy internships crazy job offers Right. And for me, that was just, you know, it was just, a, I don't know. And you were doing your thing. I mean, I was doing my thing, but you know, when you're like, um, I was just so impressed that yeah. I was, that I met first, I was impressed that I made the decision to come to Howard. Right. But I gained a strong appreciation after I graduated, you know, when I got back into like the quote unquote real world, you know, um, it was just different for me. Let me tell you, man, and when I really think about it, but you know what's interesting? I mean, Howard, I mean, Howard, I, I got to say, I do think that Howard people are across the board exceptional. Mm -hmm. Like when you, when you say you went to Howard, even when I look at resumes, when I'm hiring somebody, I'm always, I, I get excited, you know, because I know the standards that we have there. I know the love of the culture that you should get from that experience. You're not going to walk out of here not feeling confident about who you are and able to deliver. And um, it's exceptional. But you know what it makes me think of so also, man, is that not everybody, not all of our, of our community has that experience. Not enough. Yeah. So what does that mean? I don't know. But we have to, it shouldn't take that kind of exceptionalism, you know, talk about American exceptionalism, Howard exceptionalism to be successful. And there are lots of, I don't know what I'm thinking about here, but 
you know, we have to lead where we can. Yeah, we got to be intentional. You know, yeah. we got to be intentional. Like when when I see somebody that wants to go into dance or whatever, I got to be like, hey, check out Step Africa. And you could check that other program out too that's run, run by this other person. But right. look look at this. You know what I'm saying? You, it's just exposure. And when you think about, you know, why I asked you about what is African-American history, some people go their whole life and not know our history, you yeah. know? And that's the advantage that other cultures have, I feel like, over us is that, you know, when I was in high school it was guys they they knew i'm 100 percent irish you know my they was they was able to trace back everything about their history and at the time you're in high school i'm like not a big deal but right when you're older you realize how important his knowing your history is to your confidence and your decision making you know because it answers a lot of questions so howard did that um a lot for me and yeah. even even joining the fret you know that you know i was like if anything this is a written history of <laughs> going back to a hundred plus years. At least right. we know that this narrative was controlled by black folks and I could, you know, show it to my, my kids and I could have pride in it, you know? No, without question, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I can't understand enough, man, the power of knowing your culture and, and, and loving your culture and knowing your history. It really helps you navigate. Like even like right now, these times we're in, Historical perspective helps me move through it, yeah. and we will move through it successfully. The question is, how do we move forward and make the progress that we need to do right now? You know, as a, as a business owner, how has this affected your business model? Oh, man, it's been devastating to my business, to be honest, if I'm really being honest about it. Um, when Step Africa... Uh, when the pandemic hit, we were uh, on Broadway performing. Wow. Really? Uh, in the third week. Yeah, we were in the third. We were on a limited run there at this theater at 42nd and 7th, you know, in the heart of Broadway. Uh, a show that we had called Drunk Folk. And it was, I got some great press and was sold out for the entire week. And I'll never forget it. I went to the theater and uh, we had a show that morning. It was sold out, but only like 50 people came. And I was like, What's going on? Like you can see the fear start to take seat. You know, it was starting to take seat in the people where they were not wanting to gather anymore. Man. And that night they called and said Broadway was shutting down and all the theaters had to close. And we were just kind of sitting there with a hit show and our set is on the show. And it was like, you know, everything we had worked for was over. So it, the pandemic has been huge. We have, South Africa as a nonprofit has lost about al almost a million dollars and potential revenue that we would we, that was on the books to earn Damn. Uh, since March 16th through now uh, the summer. So, but you know, as a Howard uh, School of Business alum, you know, I had planned for the rainy day. So I've thought about how to survive this. And so me and my staff have figured out a way to navigate through this. We're still employing 14 full-time artists, even though our revenue has been shot. And, and that, that's a lot to be able to employ artists, too. Yeah, man. You know, Full-time. You know, because these aren't, quote-unquote, essential, you know, workers. This is, right. these are people that really have to be skilled to earn a living. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? I know, I know that, I know you take a lot of pride in that as a business owner. And that responsibility of being a business owner is, it's huge because you, you're not just, it's not just your family. You got 14 families when they don't, right. when they got problems, they bring them right on your doorstep. Right. You know? So, you know, yeah. and to our model and to the company, they are essential, you know? Right, right, right. And, you know, as a black business, you know, at another organization, they probably would have been the first to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And we had to do a short term furlough. That was a smart business decision. But as soon as we can bring them back, we brought them back and we're committed to trying to figure out how to make it work. And I think that's why I'm glad to, to, to lead the institution. You know, I'm not at the whim of someone else about whether we'll survive or not. It's up to us. And so um, I think we're going to, we're going to make it through this. I'm so do you have your own location, so. your own physical location? 
No, I mean, one of the things I focused on as a business owner is not to deal in the business of space, yeah? So I've always been about shared space. We don't own our own office. You know, I own my own home, but we haven't had the need to own our own building. Mm -hmm. I think it's a smart thing to do, uh, but I wanted to invest more in human capital and people than I did in physical spaces. You know, yeah. the people are what makes Step Africa strong. So that's where most of our money, that's where, I'm, that's where most of our dollars go. So, you know, if any of those Howard folks want to make a donation, they need a tax deduction. I want, you to, I want them to think about Step Africa. Absolutely, man. We need to, to talk yeah. later about how we can make, and you may already be doing this, but a, a something with Step Africa, some annual Howard Step Africa something, because uh, we got a lot of, a huge Howard following, and um, I think it would be great for people to support what you got going on. And I love it. I, you know, I, I went on, obviously went on YouTube and looked at all your stuff. It's, you know, it's top notch. I mean, they don't just let anybody on Broadway. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. They just don't let anybody say, oh yeah, yeah, we could do that. Right. You know, they, I had a, a young lady yesterday I interviewed. She's on Broadway. She played Nala the, um, in The Lion King. Oh yeah? Yeah, she dances and sings too, man. I can connect you guys. Um, Please do. Want. But yeah, she's uh she's playing a Lion King lead role right now. Um and uh she went to Howard Theater Art, so so oh, yeah, that's man. excellent. That's yeah, good I, to know. Yeah, I'll definitely connect you with her. Um, please do, man. I mean, you know, Broadway won't open again, they say until January. Yeah. Well, this pandemic has had a, a crazy effect on artists all across, you know. Yeah, she was telling me, I was asking her, like, what are you doing to kind of keep stay sane? She was saying in her in her living room, man, she's like you know, I, I sing, I dance, like I'm practicing my monologue. She's like, she's still like ready, you know, like she's still ready. And she said, you know, and just like you, you know, she, she understands like as a black actress, because she's been kind of on, on a high trajectory since she graduated, but she was saying still, she knows that as a black actress, like it can be taken away at any moment. Right. So she never felt like she never feels like she made it, or you know, kind of like when I was like, "How did it feel to be in the Smithsonian?" You like good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> She's like got that like, "Hey man, like I'm humble. I'm humble." <laughs> like yo, like I'm hungry. Like you know, what I'm saying I worry about. I let everybody else talk about that. You know. You're right. Yeah, I, and, and I, I understand why she feels that way because she's yeah. like. I'm out here. I'm trying to do the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so saying, I, I, I find that in, that's a common thread in uh, a lot of people. But then when I kind of break it down, like, yo, you doing it? They be like, yeah, you right, you right, you right. But still, <laughs> like, you know, like, I just been working. You know, I, you know, when I look back and reflect, yeah, it's a big deal. But, you know, like this is what my life is. You know. Yeah. You know? So that's that's dope, man. So, you graduate from Howard, and. And are you, so you graduated from Howard. How do your parents feel about you going to Africa? Oh, man, they were, they were, they were a little nervous at first. My mother in particular, my grandmothers were. were uh, the OGs, they like. They were like, <laughs> they, they, were like not, they were Brian, not excited, man. What they is Brian concerned. doing? <laughs> Where is he going? What well, is at least, this? At least you ain't changing name like Brian X. They really would have <laughs> probably been. <laughs> yeah, you know, I probably would have, but I know they would have been tripping, so. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I, I'll just keep the, keep the, keep the name. Yeah, no, nah, definitely. <laughs> I'd probably done all kind of, you know, man, I'd probably done all kind of stuff. It wasn't for my parents and my grandparents and how I felt about them in my life. You know what I'm saying? It's interesting how they can, they can kind of anchor you. Yeah, it's the gift and the curse, man. You know, it is, bro. It's like you don't want to disappoint them. You don't want to go against somebody that knows you better than yourself. Right. But at the same time, you got an itch you need to scratch. You right. need a fulfillment. You got you want to get that. But it's kind of like if they didn't, things may not have worked out the way that they worked out for you now. You know, it's weird. You know what I'm saying? If you would have, if you would have um, went your own route, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, you know, but as long as you know the love is there and they trying to really guide you in the right way, you know. You can, you can accept it. Yeah, you can accept it. But it's yeah. like, man, you know, I want to do this. They're like, nah, nah, too many people fail. But you're like, that's not me, though. That's not my story. <laughs> you know? So when do you kind of say, okay, this can be a business? Yeah. You know, this is going to be a business. 
when when is there a strong enough demand for you to say I'm gonna dedicate my life to doing this? I think that uh, really, 1994, I lead 12 of my frat brothers and two sisters to Johannesburg, South Africa for the first Step Africa International Cultural Festival. We have such a good time. We get back on the plane and head back to DC. And it becomes clear that no one wants this thing to stop. Oh. I can just kind of feel it. Like the moment everybody talking about, like, man, that was so crazy. Yeah, one light that was good. It was like, when are we going back? Yeah. So I think almost immediately it was like, hmm. So and these are African partners. Oh, frat brothers, these, these are um your chapter brothers? Yeah, these yeah, yeah, beta beta brothers. Wow. Yeah. And it was like, we want to do it again. And you know, that's it's you know, being a business owner sometimes is about listening, right? And so when they said that, I was like, okay, it was my idea. I'm glad you guys are excited. Let's do it again. And I talked to my partners in South Africa, and they, and they were like, we want to do it again. And we just started figuring it out. And then we did it again. 1994, we, the whole year, 1995, we're back. So, so at that point, what, what point is this? Is this your only source of income? Oh, man, that took some time. I mean... At that time, I'm still working full time for a nonprofit called Africare that's actually here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I do that. Actually, you know, it's funny. I do that. So I'm moonlighting. I'm doing Step Africa. You know, my free time is my passion. 1996, I start doing Step Africa full time. Right. So only two, maybe two and a half years later, I start doing it full time. And was that like a contract you got or was it just a... No, nah, man, it was a breaking, leap of faith. Bro. Leap of faith? It was a leap of faith. And it was an amazing leap of faith. You know, my parents like anchored me down, covered me, <laughs> took care of that rent. Actually, I actually just bought a house the same year. Uh, and yeah, I guess I, it was. And um, they kind of, they helped me out. They kind of, because you know, as an entrepreneur, this was so challenging. It, it could be tough. And they, but they, they held me down for that first year while I tried to figure it out. And then I got, uh, and then I started to figure out how to create revenue from it. Now it wasn't significant revenue, bro. Right, right. Like it was like just enough to survive revenue. I mean, you're starting a business from zero. Right. A business that no one even thinks can be a business. So at this point, you're like choreographer, accountant. Lead dancer, <laughs> booking, booking HR, agent, HR, yeah, HR, booking, legal. You're all of travel that. Travel agent. Damn. So you, but but you're actually dancing yourself. I at that time, what's good is at that time I'm not stepping. I mean, by that time, it's just my frat brothers doing like the, the, the shows. I might pop in, but I'm like structuring the show. Like they would do the shows, I would speak, introduce. I was like the MC, right? <laughs> Cause they, I brought a bunch of brothers. They were like my younger frat brothers. So they, I wouldn't even step in with them like that. Okay. I started stepping again, probably around 2000. Maybe, no, like 1997. Once I start formalizing Step Africa. So, you know, we started doing, we're doing South Africa, Step Africa in Johannesburg. At some point we say, you know what? We should do what we do in Johannesburg here in the U.S. And that's when we start teaching our children teaching the tradition of stepping across the country. And I start stepping, getting back into the game of stepping as well. Not just managing the group, but actually performing it as well. So these guys that are stepping, are they students mm -hmm. or are they? Yeah, they were students. They were, high, they were undergraduates. So what, what is it like kind of leading these step, steppers that are, that, you know, they, you know, they're stepping, but they're not really, in it like the way you know they're not like in it the way that somebody who always wanted to dance is oh man it was perfect because it was honest okay you know at that point we're bringing the true tradition of stepping to the continent of africa not like step africa now is a professional company with full-time dancers performing on broadway all over the world back then it's just the root of the tradition the fraternity and and, and later the sorority style of stepping at right? this time it's just my frat my frat brothers and they're basically doing their 10 to 15 minute show 
in Johannesburg for the people. So I'll never forget that first time we're in Soweto and we step, we're stepping in the streets, you know, and the people are gathering around us. I have pictures from that. And they're like, what are, who are, who are, what are they doing? Who are these people? But they connect with it. Man, I, I can't even tell you. I get excited thinking about it. They connect with us immediately. It's like, who are you? Let's, I want to see more of you. I want to connect with you. So the brothers, my frat brothers, they're all, they're all excited, man. They're doing what they do back in Washington, D.C., but now they're doing it in the motherland. And the motherland is loving them. And the motherland wants to see more of it. So we just kind of took off from there. How, how does it feel to put in that type of work and then you see the look on people's faces and the feeling that it, it gives them, you know? Like what? Man, it felt it felt great, bro. Yeah. You know, it felt great. It felt great to see, you know, older South African women look at us like their children. You know, because we looked familiar to them. Now that and because we were stepping doing something they were kind of familiar with through their own traditions, mm -hmm. it looked familiar, and it was like, this is good, man. This is uh, we're home, and we want to and we want to keep this in our lives. And so ever since then, man, Africa has been a huge part of my life. Wow. You know? How, how was it built? How did you go about building the team? I'd imagine that was kind of. Oh, you mean initially or now? Initially. I mean, you know, you know, like the foundational pieces that you need to, you know, like you said, you weren't bringing in a ton right. of money, you know, no. you probably every little bit counted, but it's only 24 hours in a day. You know, right. so you have to be able to dedicate yourself to really growing the business and really trust other people to run, yeah. do certain things. Like how, what, what was it like building a team, especially for you? Because essentially there's no blueprint for what yeah. you were doing. You know, I think that's where the frat was so critical to my development, you know? So it wasn't hard to find the team mm -hmm. that already existed, beta. You know, it was beta. <laughs> you gonna step whether you want to? <laughs> oh, it was beta. I mean, now, let me tell you now, when I first told, when I came back and I told the chapter, I was like, look, frat, I got an idea. We're gonna take stepping for the first time ever to Africa. Who's down? I mean, all the hands just shot up. Okay. They were hype. You know, because I, I, you know, I graduated, I'd been with them, I'd stepped with them before, I'd pledged them. That's probably what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I probably, if they told you. Yeah, you can't say no to him. They'd be like, we didn't care about him, man. <laughs> but, but they wanted to go to Africa. Oh, so you were able to, 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 to get that paid for? Yeah, man. We, oh, we paid for it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, of course. Who don't want to do that? We hustled. Yeah. They were stepping all over Washington, D.C. Yeah. We were raising money, man. We, we were doing grassroots fundraisers. In 1994. So one, what, are those, what are those early revenue streams? What are the kind of things that you had to say, okay, these are the ways that we're going to bring in revenue? Oh, man. A, it was step shows. We, we won some step shows, mm -hmm. right? That was critical. That was seed money. Man, that's stress, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's stress. Bro. That is stress. Man, we... I'm, those, we, we mobilized so well, bro. I love those days when I think about it. I love to see them brothers and kind of get in a room with some, some cognac or something and talk about it because it was just really funny. Like, and, and everybody was charged with raising a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. right? You had to raise a certain amount of money. So we created like this whole fundraising mechanism to where we would say, hello, we're Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Beta Chapter. We're ready to go to South Africa. Uh, would you support us? And, you know, parents supported us. Family supported us, friends and family wrote checks and everybody was responsible for a certain amount of money. And if you were a little short, somebody else might raise a little bit more. So it was like we were all working together to make this happen. Because at that time, I didn't know about grants or anything like that. Yeah. We, was, I, we just wanted to make it happen. Yeah. We raised that money, man. We raised more money than we probably ever have in the front. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. 
you start having success. I mean, you start getting awards, yeah. you know, recognition. <laughs> Anybody, you know, and I know a lot of time when that happens, people think it happened overnight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Like people, you know, what what was it? What was like the what was like um the major turning point for Step Africa when you really like assess like man, you know, my organization yeah. is the shit. You know what I'm saying? I know you probably already, always thought that from jump, but like, you know, yeah. When did you really like? When did everybody else find out? <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it was interesting. Here we are, young African-American brothers and sisters in Johannesburg, six months after the election of President Nelson Mandela, right? And we're on Good Morning South Africa. We're featured in the Johannesburg Star, getting all this press. We're attracting all this attention. It's like it's new. And that's when I knew. I said, this is going to be, this is going to be a fun ride. Man. Because the the people, I didn't have a press agent. I didn't have a, didn't have a publicist, right? Mm-hmm. The press was coming to us because what we were doing was so unique and special at that time. And then we get back to the U.S. It was all about our work in South Africa at the time. But, that, but I think, you know, at some point we start performing here. And a major turning point was when we got the opportunity to perform at the Kennedy Center here in Washington, D.C. for a week. So it was our first week-long run of shows in D.C. And they put those shows on sale, and they sold out completely. And CNN came and just wow. us. So when you get booked for those shows, they're basically paying you to perform, and they're, yeah. promote, they're promoting your brand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're promoting this brand right here. Man. Step Africa. They're promoting it like crazy. And... Uh, Sold out shows, and I think that's when we knew, okay, now we can take this to another place. It's not just about our festival in Johannesburg. It's about what we do here in the United States. And ever since then, I've been taking the company to over 60 countries around the world. You've been in over 60 countries? 60 countries, man. And Damn. It, in the union, every state in America, except Africa, has performed in, except for Hawaii. Really? And I need to get make that happen. Sixty countries. Yes, bro. So okay, I got lead up questions. Um, your social life. <laughs> I don't mean. I'm, I, <laughs> I mean, running a business is tough, man. It's tough. Yeah. You you you're essentially running an international business. Yeah. You're running, you're running a small business that's an international business. Yeah. Um, you're traveling a lot. How, how did, so in terms of your social life, yeah. Is that, how does that affect it? Is it a struggle or is no, it? No, man. Excellent. I think <laughs> social life, family life, you know, I don't have any children, so that, that helps, right? Yeah. But, but I think, I don't think I've been able to do it if I had children, but. You know, relationships and uh, having good times. I, you know, this is for me, South Africa has been like a, a, you know, a life, like a, a love song. You know, this is what I was, I really feel like I was brought, I don't, there's nothing else I could do. I've been doing this for 25 years. There's nothing else I want to do. Yeah, you've been doing it longer than you've been doing anything else. Right. I love, I love doing this work. I love every aspect of South Africa and, and what we bring to our community. So that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. So, you know, I, I can have, and I have a great time doing that. I have a great time relaxing when I'm not doing that. So it's like, it's kind of like when you really, I think as a person who really feels like he has a mission and a purpose, like, like that whole purpose driven life thing. I really feel like this is what I want to do. I love this stuff. How do you feel when you see other cultures it's one thing to embrace it, you know what I'm saying? Which is what we, of course, what we always have wanted is to yeah. be accepted. But I guess when you see other cultures, um, From- you know, not give credit to where it came from. Yeah. And kind of make it seem like it's something that they came up with or, 
exploited or incorporated yeah. into, let's say if it was Broadway on step Africa, like doing a- African whatever. Yeah. And they did it. They did a good job, but they don't give credit to where it came from. Um, you know, that's always been a motivating factor with my work with Step Africa. It's one of the reasons why I work so hard, man. Because, you know, I, I grew up going to Howard. I looked and I saw what happened to jazz and the blues and other art forms that African-Americans would somewhat lose control of. Mm-hmm. And I thought about it. I said, you know, if I'm going to really innovate this form and take it to the continent of Africa, I want to push it as far as we can go. I don't want the art form to get popular and then another community that didn't help to create this tradition uh, control the narrative of the art form. Yeah. I just became even more aggressive about it. I want to perform as many places as possible. All over Europe, I want to hit it. You know? Yeah. South America, I want to cover it. I want them to know that, because I want people to understand that this art form was created by African-American college students who became members of fraternities and sororities, and that there's a deep history that's connected to this art form that's much more than dance, you know, expected to scholars and community servants and yeah. good brothers, good sisters. So I've been preaching that my whole 25 years, and I will continue to preach that, you know, until I no longer run this company. It, I mean, at some point, I look, look forward to giving this organization to the next generation to run. I think it's coming around sooner than later. Man, that's awesome. So what, what, are, what are you guys doing now? Like currently, well, here in COVID land, we're trying to figure out the next steps. So we're looking at shifting to the digital platform. Uh, looking forward to creating content for our audiences online, but I'm also plotting and waiting until we can gather again. You know, this is a wild time, man. I pre- tell you this, you know, my son takes karate. Yeah, um, and. Now it's, it's virtual. Yeah, how's that going? He loves it. And, I, you know, it, man? It, yeah, I mean, he, he started obviously in the class. Right. But I've seen how it's helped his confidence, you know, and just giving him a level of discipline. Right. Um, but I was going to suggest to you, man, I think that you should check that out. And you'll be able to reach a lot of people because it's done virtually. Like he, Literally this morning at 10 a.m., he had karate class for 30 minutes. Really, and man? If you were to offer something like that, I would definitely sign my kids up. <laughs> you know what awesome, I'm saying? Because man. it's, you know, you, wanna, you want them to gain appreciation for things, and especially knowing your story, you know, I could promote that on the Howard platform easy. Okay, and, bro. You know, we got 30,000 followers. I mean, we could talk more about it later, but, you know, I think karate, I think we pay like one thirty a month. And it's, yeah. it's 2.30. The classes, minutes. really? Yeah, it's two 30-minute sessions every every week. But they learn stuff. They learn, like, all the parts of the body. They learn all these little fighting stances, you know, all these little moves. And it's all virtual. But because the instructor cares so much about it, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it's obvious, like, how much he loves it. It's right. Like, oh, yeah, we wouldn't dare take our son unless we, you know, we couldn't afford it. But um, I think it's something that you should look into because I know that you got a staff and you probably scratching your head like, okay, I don't want to let nobody go. Right. How do we create revenue? Yeah, you want to create revenue, and I think that that's a good way. Like, even if you got, just think, if you got a hundred people to pay you a hundred bucks a month, right? You're delivering quality content, and now you're impacting households through zoom they do it all through zoom like it's it's crazy so, so all yeah, through man. zoom look yeah i'm gonna look into that bro you know i'm glad you said that because i've looked at that model a little bit i'm gonna look at it um again yeah just right brainstorm around it and maybe ask people like hey would you sign your kid up if i did this you know how much how much would y'all pay so it's just the instructor he's by himself and he's just going over the fundamentals. And I think the cool thing with dance, I mean, especially with kids, man, because they have so much energy. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and as parents, man, we're looking for them to release that energy in a positive way. And what better way to release it than through an art form that is helping them learn about their culture? 
Right. So no, man. So yeah, no, I, we're not gonna look into that. We're gonna, we're gonna be doing a uh, step Africa's getting ready for a virtual summer camp. Summer steps with step Africa. So I'd encourage the people to look on our, our website, check us out, and then we can see and then uh, learn about what we're doing. And we'll be creating a lot more programming via Instagram and our Facebook page as well. Yeah. So what you do, man? Just tag me, Howard alumni. I'll repost it. What advice do you have for? you know, the 18-year-old Brian that will be coming into Howard right now that wants to get the best out of his Howard experience and yeah. also get the best out of pursuing their passion after Howard. Oh, man. All right, one thing I would say, first thing I would say is, um, well, I'd say so many different things, but A, I would say have patience, right? Especially at that age, you want everything to happen now. And I would say, you know what? Relax and be present in the moment and have a really, really good time, right? I would definitely say that. Be patient and be patient and be present, right? Because we can spend so much time thinking about what we want to do that we kind of miss what we're doing, you know? And those times are precious times, amazing times that you, don't, that you, that you can't get back. So go all the way in and enjoy them as much as you can. With mm -hmm. on the future, but not obsessing with what's going to happen and what's next, you know? I would also say get out the country even more, right? I did a three-month uh, program overseas while I was at Howard to Spain. I probably should have done like a year. It might have delayed my graduation by another three or four months, but I would, I would say either do it while you're at Howard, do study abroad, get out the country just to see, just witness this world, know something else more about, um, than the United, about African culture, culture period in the United States, you know, because that'll broaden your, your worldview. And then what, at a young age, and then what it did for me is it reinforced my love for what we already had. So I would say even be more, be more, even more aggressive about international travel opportunities. And not just for tourism, but to really stay, live, and absorb another culture, and then come back on home and see how you feel. Hmm. I think that's what I would. That's what I would say, man. Hmm. You know. What about legacy? You know, a hundred years. What are we saying about yeah. Ryan Williams? What are we saying about Step Africa? You know what's so funny, man? I don't really care. <laughs> I know that's a crazy statement. No, you're not the only person that gives that answer. I had Stan Verrett, another Beta brother, on here. Yeah. Yeah, I had him on. He was like, I don't really think about it. You know? I don't, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's see, if I do think about it, and I might think about it very rarely, I think that it would just be that this is an organization that tried to represent and champion African American culture across the board, you know? that really brought forth, they created space. That's probably what it would be. We created space for an art form that prior to our existence was not fully respected uh, by really anyone, by very few. And we were able to make it something, uh, or help, uh, help it grow and nurture its development. You know? You strike me as somebody that doesn't try to please everybody. <laughs> well, well, you know, actually, bro, you know, was, that's, that's funny you say that. As a business person, you know, we're always in the business of pleasing. Well, yeah, I mean, you take your craft serious. You know. Obviously, but when I say pleasing people, you're not, you can't please everybody. Like, we know that. No. You focus no. on the people that appreciate, you know, the you work. focus on your core, basically, you know. So. That's true. So, yeah. So, thanks for coming to the show, man. I, Man, I really good, to, appreciate good to connect it. with you, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Nice to meet you, man. Um, Sometimes, you know, I don't know what to expect from these interviews, but, you know, it's it's just good to be able to learn about Step Africa. Now when I hear it, you know, I feel like I, I know you in a sense, and I feel I yeah. have a bigger appreciation for what your grind is and uh, what you're going through. So anything that I can do to support, you got my information, man. I'm more than happy. To, to help because I want to I want to see Step Africa go for another 25 plus years so hey Joshua man thank you so much bro I really appreciate that brother and I really feel that and I, I'm gonna reach out to you because we, we need 
we need more people to know about our work. And if you can help us with that, yeah. We, if you if you're really helping us with that, you know, because I know you can help us, yeah. and, I, and you will help us. Yeah. That means a lot to me, man. And I, I look forward to uh, working with you down the road, man. Thank you for your work, bro. Thank you for shining a light on people in the community. I really appreciate that. No problem, man. Thank you. Thank you for joining the HU Movement Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.